Welcome to the Proceedings Podcast. I'm Bill Hamlet, the Editor-in-Chief of Proceedings at the U.S. Naval Institute. Good to have you on board, everybody. We're going to do a preview today of the International Navy's issue, the May issue of Proceedings, which you should be getting in your mailboxes or uh, on your computers uh, very soon. Um, and with me, joining me today are my uh, co-hosts when we usually do a, uh, an overview of a, of a new issue of the magazine. So I've got Bill Bray, the Deputy Editor-in-Chief of Proceedings, and I've got Brian O'Rourke, who is the Senior Editor of uh, Proceedings. Good to have you guys on board. Morning, Bill. Good morning. Good to be here. It's a dismal day of weather in the Annapolis, uh, D.C. area. Some might say, you know, great Navy day, but uh, reminds me of a lot of days walking down the long pier in, uh, in Norfolk during my uh, Navy career. Uh, I want to point out that this uh, episode of the podcast is brought to you by the members of the Naval Institute. So since 1873, we are now on our 150th year. The members of the Institute have been the foundation for everything we do from proceedings to podcasts and Naval History Magazine, the Naval Institute Press, books, our events and conferences, everything we do is brought to you and sort of undergirded by the members of the Naval Institute. So to become a member, go to usni.org forward slash join. Okay, guys, let's start talking about the May issue of proceedings. So it's the International Navy's issue. Uh, so every year, the, the big thing in the International Navy's issue is that we reach out and Bill, this has fallen to you uh, the last few years. We reach out to the chiefs of many uh, international navies, essentially all the navies around the world, and we ask them to answer a question, uh, and then we publish their answers in proceedings. So what was the question this year? The question was, uh, given the ongoing Russian war against Ukraine, continued tensions in the South China Sea, illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing, and attacks on undersea infrastructure. Uh, we asked the world's navies, what lessons have your Navy and or Coast Guard drawn from these or other threats? What changes will you attempt to implement as a result? All right, how many, how many uh, international Navy chiefs responded this year? Uh, 22, which is a little low from uh, the, the average over the past uh, five years since I've been doing this. I think last year, 32 was the highest, and we generally would be in the 25 to 30 range in most years. But we also got a separate uh, one from Ukraine, which I'll mention in a minute. So really, if you count that, it's 23. Uh, so one of the ones that, that jumped out at me, and I mentioned it in my editor's page in the issue, is the uh, the one by the Finnish Navy chief, uh, which kind of wraps up with Finland is now part of NATO. So that might be one of the, the biggest stories of the year. What were some other ones that, that jumped out at you? Um, well, first of all, we got every year there's always a newbie, right? Or at least maybe a couple that at least since I've been doing this uh, since 2019. Um, and we got Barbados this year um, from, you know, it's always nice to get a Caribbean uh, country. Um, they are our neighbors and sometimes we often overlook them. Uh, they deal with a lot of uh, migration problems, uh, illegal fishing problems, uh, things of that nature. And of course, our Coast Guard fellow this year, Commander Hulse, Steve Hulse, is on his way uh, to be the uh, naval attache in Barbados um, starting this summer. Um yeah, yeah, pretty cool. Um, so we, we had a pretty good representation geographically, even though our numbers were down. Um, I do uh, I do appreciate the uh, the Europeans, and you can really see if you if you read these um, responses, you can really see how the Russian uh, invasion of Ukraine has reshaped uh, their thinking on uh, on security in general, but also on the, the need for um, strong navies um, to bolster NATO in the region. Um, Japan uh, is answered, usually answers, not every year, but uh, very strong on, on, you know, the Japanese military is changing. Um, their constitutional context for having a military is changing. And you can see that reflected in their answer as well. Yeah, the, the Japanese are definitely, um, as we had not only the answer from um, the chief, but we also have had some Japanese officers writing about sort of shifting the, the, the center of gravity of their forces down to the southwest towards the Ryukus away from 
Hokkaido and uh, the, the northern threat that they always thought about in terms of Russia, which is you know still on their minds, but um, that shifting down towards the Ryukus, uh, towards southern Japan, towards the, the China threat axis is uh, is palpable uh, when you read you know Japanese uh, military leaders these days. Maybe at some point we'll start talking about their big decks as aircraft carriers instead of helicopter destroyers, given that they've just beefed up the decks of one for F-35s. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I wanted to talk for a second about uh, an article that's in the issue. It's, it's by um, Colin Ko, who is a Singapore author and academic. He teaches uh, at the, I'll, I'll pull it up here in a second. He t he's a research fellow at the Institute of Defense and Strategic Studies, which is a constituent unit of the Raja Ratnam School of International Studies at the Yan Nanyang Technical University in Singapore. Um, and uh, this is part of the ongoing, although we haven't had one in a couple of months, but the ongoing maritime counterinsurgency project, which started last summer. Uh, Dr. Ko, uh, gives us the, the regional perspective. And, and he says, you know, it, it kind of starts out with saying the, it's a David and Goliath story. Uh, Southeast Asia can resist China's gray zone aggression in the South China Sea with help. And he says the stereotypical image of Southeast Asian nation responses to China's maritime coercion is one of meekness or at worst submission. While sometimes true, this view is based on the fact that Southeast Asian nations are smaller and weaker than China, and that their economic dependence must limit their responses to Beijing's aggression. However, he then goes on to point out ways in which Vietnam and Malaysia, Indonesia, and uh, especially the Philippines um, have actually pushed back against the way the Chinese, not only the, the people's, uh, the, the fishing fleet, and then the people's um, armed forces, maritime militia, but also the China Coast Guard and the PLA Navy, have been aggressively uh, overfishing uh, within the EEZs of those countries. Uh, there's a, just a lot going on. And, and then he talks about some ways that uh, extra regional countries, i.e. the United States and Australia, perhaps uh, NATO countries, European Union countries, can bolster the efforts of the regional navies and regional coast guards to, uh, to push back against China's overreach. And uh, two of those ways that he talks about, the first one is maritime domain awareness, which is a lot, a lot has been going on there uh, to tie in the, uh, the ability of uh, all the regional players to understand what's going on out in the South China Sea, to track and follow uh, and have you know, good sort of targeting information, if you will, on where the Chinese Navy is, where the China Coast Guard is, where those um, uh, maritime militia forces are so that you can take the limited naval and coast guard units that those countries possess and push them in the right place. So they're not just out searching blindly, but they're, they're moving and, and um, operating in a concerted way that uh, they can show China that, hey, we know where you are and we're not, we're not accepting this. And then the, the second thing that he mentions is uh, he mentioned shipbuilding and about, you know, some efforts. It's been a bit hard uh, all those countries were hit hard during, you know, COVID economically and some of their programs to build new ships, particularly offshore patrol vessels, uh, was, was delayed. Uh, but he talks about some ways to, uh, to, to help bolster the shipbuilding and the way that those countries working together could perhaps uh, bolster the shipbuilding so that they can put more units in their navies and in their coast guards uh, you know, to help strengthen their response. So it's a good piece. Again, this maritime counterinsurgency project continues. I know some people, some of our listeners and readers uh, take issue with the term. Sometimes we do a little bit too, counterinsurgency. You call it gray zone, you call it hybrid warfare, whatever you want to call it. You know, it's the rose is a rose by any other name kind of thing. But, you know, the Chinese uh, military, the China Coast Guard, the China uh, Armed Forces Militia, uh, are operating in ways that are inimical and against the um, international norms. It's against the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, their, their claims to the entire South China Sea, their, their fishing and resource extraction in the uh, exclusive economic zones 
of all those countries around the South China Sea is it's illegal, right? So this is a good piece by somebody who is a an expert who's in the region, who's a Singaporean, and who follows this issue very, very closely. It's great to have uh, Colin Co in our pages. So I don't know if you guys had any thoughts of that, or you wanted to go on to the next ones uh, you want to highlight. What I thought was interesting about it is a lot of the maritime coin thesis and articles that we've seen tend to see countries in Southeast Asia and around the South China Sea as um, passive victims. Um, you know, they, they are almost without agency until the U.S. Navy can show up and, you know, put teeth in them. And Colin more or less rejects that. It's not as yeah. though... It's not as though they, these countries are acting, you know, right up to the precipice of a shooting war or anything. But it's a much more nuanced view of what this means. And, I, you know, I have my thoughts about the coin terminology for it. But whatever you want, as you said, whatever you want to call it, there's bad stuff going on. I thought it was a refreshing view to say, you know, this isn't as simple as, you know, oh, poor us, where's the U.S. Navy? And if the U.S. Navy isn't here, then what are we going to do? It's here's what we're doing with or without the U.S. Navy. And it's a fresh fresh take for us anyway, and uh, I enjoyed reading it. Yeah, I, I would agree. It also points out at the end the importance of a whole of government effort for uh, for all of those countries, right? That it's this is, you know, something pushing back against what China's doing requires diplomatic power, it requires economic power, it requires um, uh, military and Coast Guard uh, capabilities, it requires intelligence, surveillance, reconnaissance. Um, it, and um, uh, this is something that, and, and also he suggests, you know, the, the need to work together as, a, you know, not an alliance, but a group of countries that are sort of uh, making a concerted effort together because the Chinese would love to divide and conquer. They like to uh, take um, a one at a time stance and, or approach. We're going to deal with the Philippines right now and we'll get them to knuckle under. And once the Philippines have knuckled under, we'll get the Vietnamese to knuckle under. But when they all push back, you know, sort of concertedly, that's, that's a problem for the Chinese when, when they get multiple countries that push back, it, um, uh, it makes them sit up and take notice. It's not just the Americans. It's not just the Japanese. It's not just <laughs> Vietnam. It's like all this area. And so that's a, uh, that, you know, that can work pretty effectively as a block. Um, okay, Brian, you, uh, you had something on, I think, innovation cell you wanted to highlight? Uh, yeah, the innovation cell this month is kind of fun. It appealed um, in a good way to my inner 12 year old. Um, <laughs> <laughs> if you guys remember, the, and really, I mean, my inner 12 year old in this case, I think it was a 1982 movie with Clint Eastwood Firefox. Oh, yeah. Um, in, in which he's, uh, you know, he's chopping wood at his like compound in Alaska. And somebody lands by helicopter to say, we need you for one more mission. <laughs> and, uh, and Clint goes off to Russia to steal the MiG-31 Firefox, which is not only super duper stealth, um, which begs the question how he gets into the dogfights later. But um, it's super duper stealth and it's controlled by his brain. And so it's got a helmet that, that reads his brain waves. Um, there's a funny moment where he's sitting in the cockpit going, fire rear missiles, damn it, in that Clint Eastwood thing. And then he remembers he has to think in Russian. Um, it's, a, it, it's a silly movie. Uh, it's a corny movie. It was great fun when I was 12. It was a much better um, book, by the yeah, way. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's a cornball scene where he lands on the ice and his nose gear stops like three inches from the crack in the ice. And the whole theater groaned. I remember that. But at the heart of it, this is a great hook um, mm -hmm. that, that the author has, um, you know, Lieutenant Commander Mark West. It's a great hook because lots of people remember the movie and it gave us a chance to put Clint Eastwood's picture in the magazine, which we don't often get. But the idea behind it is really close to reality. Um, brain machine interface is a legitimate mm -hmm. thing right now. It's not to the level of flying an advanced fighter and firing rear missiles by thinking in Russian, but it's not super far from that anymore. And so he sort of takes you through, he starts there and then takes you through the reality of it and gets into uh, different companies. Of course, this is something that Elon Musk is involved in somewhere. 
Um, gaming companies are very interested in it. And, you know, gaming has driven a lot of innovation over the years. A lot of the VR stuff that is finding commercial applications and training applications started as video game applications. Uh, it's a profitable industry. People line up to pay money for new technology in there. And um, this is this is the next big thing. Will it ever get to the point of flying an advanced fighter? I don't know. I don't think anybody knows. This could be one of those technologies that's forever 10 years away from that moment where it does everything it's promised. We've kind of been there with AI for a while. I know I can trigger Bill Bray just by saying the letters AI out loud <laughs> and machine learning, but... Um, I thought it was, it was a good piece. It was a lively piece. Um, and I think you, one of the things the innovation cell tries to do is take ideas that once were ahead of their time and that now are on the cusp of or actually moving into reality. And uh, brain machine interface is one of those. I mean, we're, we are looking at actual brain machine interfaces that exist right now that can do things that can let um, animals without much in the way of higher brain function perform things we would have thought of as higher brain function activities. So it raises questions in zoology, but more to the point, it works. Um, we'll see where it goes, but uh, Mark had a, it's a really interesting piece and a really fun read. It is. It's definitely a fun, fun read. And it's, it, it does make you think about like, where we are with the technology and where it's going to be in you know a couple of years and and how the military will apply it, uh, very interesting. And I got to give you some credit um, for our listeners who might not be aware of it, but Brian was the one who came up with the idea of innovation cell. What about two years ago? Has it, has it been that long? Oh, it, was now? A while, it was a while ago. I mean, I, it yeah. was pre twenty twenty. I don't remember. Maybe eighteen, maybe got nineteen. It was a long time. Yeah, but we've been running Innovation Cell. It's usually a one or two pager in the magazine. It's a pretty quick read. And as you pointed out, it's technology that's sort of been percolating. And now it shows real promise, right, to, to have, a, have a, a significant military impact. I mean, sometimes it's just cool new stuff. And who doesn't right. want to read about cool new stuff? But Everyone. also, it is yeah. that it's a chance to say, we overlooked this or we couldn't do this before. And maybe now we can. So Right. Right, right. Uh, speaking of cool new stuff, um, I, this is not in the May issue of the magazine, but it is new on our YouTube channel. Um, we recently hired, just to really two weeks ago, we hired uh, a, a young man uh, who we, we've had this idea, we've had this itch for a while, but we haven't had the, the bandwidth on our staff to produce short videos on some of our content that is um, easy to do a short piece on. So Combat Fleets, for example, is a one pager every month in the magazine that talks about um, a foreign Navy platform. Um, so in March, it was the Ren High class cruiser, the PLA Navy. Uh, and, and we also have the Oceans column, which is done every other month, was in, uh, initiated by Don Walsh uh, 20, 20 something years ago, a world famous uh, oceanographer. Uh, in naval history, we've got arms and armaments, we've got historic aircraft, we've got uh, USNI news team has got ideas about doing short videos. So we've started that. So the first short video is a combat fleets piece. Bill Bray, it was your voiceover. Uh, and Moon Pitch is our new employee uh, who put together the video and he pulled in images and, uh, and, and video and schematics and diagrams. Uh, but it's a great, I think, four-minute video on the Chinese Ren High class cruiser, and we're going to have more of that stuff coming. Uh, probably do one, uh, you know, I'm hope, hoping to do one a week of the combat fleets, and then we'll get into some of those other other categories. But watch, look for that uh, on the the, U, the the Naval Institute YouTube channel. Um, those are great short videos, and you know, more in the in line with you know the sort of TikTok or uh, or Reels kind of thing. And we'll see what uh, we'll see how that does, but I, I expect it's going to do well. It's uh, useful and and you know easily digestible. It's a bit like popcorn. So, if your skipper is about to give you a quiz on the Ren High Cruiser and you're a visual learner, this is for you. Um, well, for Bill Bray and I, as as uh, former Navy intelligence officers, we spent some part, uh, you know, not an insignificant part of our careers teaching operators, uh, you know, how to recognize, we call it recce training, recognize 
um, you know, Russian and Chinese and other navies platforms, particularly ships, submarines, aircraft, et cetera. And so this is this is a recce brief that is ready to go. So if you're a squadron intel officer out there in the fleet, find that video and show it to your squadron and they will they will eat it up. It's just great stuff. Uh, OK, uh, Bill, what was the other uh, article from the May issue you wanted to mention? Yeah, I would like to briefly discuss uh, uh, an article by Commander Mike McCrab, uh, U.S. Navy retired. Uh, the title of the article is International Maritime Training is a, is a Strategic Advantage. It's a two-page special um, that Mike, I'm sorry, three-page special that Mike uh, proposed to us a while back, and uh, we, we liked the idea. Uh, we had to tighten it up a little bit. But the gist of this is, well, first of all, Mike is currently the um, – the Naval Education and Training Security Assistance Field Activity Strategic Planner. That's a mouthful. But um, he is, and he's also in, in a previous, um, uh, previous job in, in his retired uh, life, he worked for the Navy International Programs Office. So Mike is really uh, one of the experts on uh, what we, the United States uh, Navy, uh, does for, or the Department of the Navy does for uh when it comes to training foreign navies and foreign Marine Corps and Coast Guards on not just our equipment, but just also our tactics, our doctrine, uh, whatever. And it's quite extensive and it's quite affordable. It's the amount of money we have to spend to do this is, is a rounding error in DOD's budget. And um, part of it is tied to our foreign military sales program. So in other words, when we sell um, an F-18 Hornet, Super Hornets to a country. There's a training piece that comes with that. Um, it's part of the contracts, but a lot of it is not. It's just normal um, training that we provide both here in the United States and abroad. Um, and, and also it includes the professional military education side of it, um, which is uh, international students coming to our schools, particularly our war colleges. And uh, there's even a call out box in this article about the Naval War College. And it's quite interesting. It was Admiral Arlie Burke who started, uh, when he was CNO, started the um, opening the Naval War College in Newport to foreign students. And since then, since 1956, 138 countries have participated, um, have sent students to the Naval War College. Um, each year, about 100 students uh, attend. And if you expand it to the other war colleges, Marine Corps University and others, there's 400 international students a year that go through uh, uh, these courses. Um, so quite quite extraordinary. And if you look around the world, um, and I mean, a high number of current uh, chiefs of navies have attended uh, either the U.S. Naval War College or in, in a, a U.S. War College in their education. So what, what does it all matter? I mean, it, I can tell you from my uh, background and when I was... Uh, about a decade ago, serving at uh, U.S. Sixth Fleet, you know, we had a, a annual uh, bilateral exercise with the Ukrainian Navy. It was called Sea Breeze, and um, and that paid huge dividends, obviously, in the current environment. Um, by the time, you know, unfortunately, unfortunately, by the time the Russian invasion in 2022, uh, the Ukrainians uh, were already understood our our operations and tactics. Um, and they are using uh, U.S. a lot of U.S. equipment, including former island-class cutters. Uh, it, you know, the Ukrainian Navy is not big, but it's been hitting above its weight in this in this current conflict. Yeah, absolutely. That that is a great piece. Um, uh, before I talk about the heritage article in this issue, Bill, I wanted to, you to highlight the uh, the professional note by Brooke Millard. So a couple of years ago. I think she was actually our first Coast Guard Federal Executive Fellow at the Naval mm -hmm. Institute. So we're now on our fourth, uh, about to finish up with Steve Holtz, who was on the pod, on, on this show a couple of weeks ago, talking about the D.A.R.E. event that we did out in San Diego. Uh, but Brooke Millard, now commander, um, and, and she's commanding officer of a Coast Guard cutter, super impressive uh, officer. And then um, she her cutter did a, a Northern Atlantic deployment and she wrote about it. What did she say? Yes. Um, so she's the commanding officer of the U.S. Coast Guard Cutter Bear. 
um, they do a annual ex or the Coast Guard does an annual exercise. I think it's annual or maybe it's biennial, but I think it's annual Operation Nanook uh, above the Arctic Circle um, with uh, allied navies, particularly the Canadians, the, the, the Danish, the French, um, and others. Um, and um, she wrote, um, I mean, the gist of this professional note is, hey, we watched, you know, these other uh, navies uh, through this exercise and we learned a lot from them. Most, the main theme is that they're doing more with less, <laughs> smaller crew sizes. Um, and, um, and so she goes through several metrics of how these uh, other um, navies, these uh, do uh, do more with less with with a smaller crew size and the advantages to doing that obviously there's a financial advantage you're not paying as many salaries and you're not uh, the the ships the the allied ships have more room for embarkation debts to do specific things because they have you know available rack space that sort of thing um yeah it's really it's really an interesting i don't know how it will play with the coast guard at large but uh, uh i think it was very um it was very honest and very forthright and uh, daring for her to write this. Yeah, I agree. No, she, uh, th there was just a lot of, you could tell there was a lot of learning going on on U.S. Coast Guard Cutter Bear, it, both in Brooke's mind as the CO, but also it, among her crew as they watched and learned and, and uh, participated and exercised with those uh, four navies that they're like, huh, they do this differently, and I kind of like the way that they do this. So there was. They have saunas on their cutters. Say that again. <laughs> they have saunas on their cutters. <laughs> some, have saunas, some have, of course, uh, uh, you know, alcohol is permitted. Uh, they're grooming uh, some of the other, uh, particularly Canadians. The grooming and uh, standards are a little different. It's okay to have a, a beard. It's okay to have, you know, dye your hair purple. Whatever the, you know, the, the she Brooke kind of ventures into this, you know, this is how you get more people to join the service by, you know, adapting with the times. Some of them have, uh, particularly Canada has already dealt with uh, legalized marijuana and how they've handled that in their, uh, in their military. I think that's an issue that the U.S. military eventually is going to have to deal with um, if, if you look at the trend line in the United States on that. Yeah, it's a, it's a good piece. I mean, whether you agree or disagree with some of those points, right, with some of those issues or, uh, you know, sort of public policy impacts, uh, it's, it's refreshing to see that through a U.S. Coast Guard cutter skipper's eyes. Uh, that, I'll just put it that, that way. That was, that was one of the most pleasurable things for me in reading it was being able to sort of see what Brooke was seeing. She writes it in a way that you go, huh, okay, that makes me sit up and take notice. Let's, let's pay attention to that. You know, perhaps we don't go that way, but it's good to know what other uh, Coast Guards and, and navies are doing. Yeah. Uh, I want to highlight just quickly the latest article in our Heritage series. So this is our 150th anniversary, as I mentioned up top. And Dennis Clift, who is our Gosh, he's, he's like the most interesting man who ever, uh, you know, ever lived. You know, forget about the Dos Equis man. Dennis Clift is uh, is a, an amazing human being. He's 86 years old, still comes to work every day. Um, and he's been putting together, looking back in our archives of proceedings uh, over the past, uh, since 1874 was our first issue of proceedings. Um, and, and every month with the theme of the issue. So this year or this month, May was Allies and Partners International Navies. So Dennis looked back at 150 years of proceedings to find articles that have, we've published on Allies and Partners. It starts off with that great quote by Winston Churchill, there's only one thing worse than fighting with allies, and that's fighting without them. Uh, but this, it's just a terrific uh, piece, as all of these have been. It's so interesting to go back because it's hard to you know, take the time and go back and read 150 years worth of, you know, a monthly ma or almost a monthly magazine became monthly in, I think, 20 or 1916. Uh, but Dennis has done that for us. Right. And so you find all these uh, incredible nuggets, you know, starting with how we, um, uh, you know, some of the original articles that talked about how, um, you know, the French Navy came to uh, the, the great support uh, at Yorktown. Um, 
So there's an article in 1931 uh, written by Navy Commander John Shafroth about the strategy of the Yorktown campaign in 1781. Uh, and then it goes all the way forward through, you know, the uh, World War I and World War II. I was very interested to see. Uh, so the CEO of the Naval Institute, Admiral Daly, his office is called the Tossig Suite, T-A-U-S-S-I-G. It's named for a guy named Captain uh, Tossig. Uh, and Tossig served in the U.S. Navy during the Boxer Rebellion as a midshipman, spent time on the USS Newark. Uh, and then during uh, World War II, oh, also, by the way, he was wounded during that expedition and he met Royal Navy Captain John Jellicoe, who historians will recognize was later Admiral Jellicoe um, during World War I. Tossig goes on and commands a destroyer, spends time uh, and, and has uh, 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 port visits and that sort of thing, serves during World War II or World War I under Admiral Sims. And then um, all of this is in, in the article. Uh, and then goes on later in his career, and he's the commanding officer of USS Little, a DD, uh, when the French um, president, Poincar, uh, visits uh, his ship. So all of that is just an interesting, you know, the, the thread of the commonality of U.S. Uh, U.S. naval, and famous U.S. naval officer uh, serving with allies and partners in different places at different times in throughout his career and throughout history. And then... Uh, Brian and Bill, you, you'll remember this just a few years ago, we published a great piece um, by a French, I think it was the French naval uh, attache at the time, that was about the how the French carrier air wing uh, came and spent time on the USS uh, Harry S. Truman when the French nuclear powered carrier was in the yards and going through an overhaul, significant overhaul. Uh, the French air wing came across and did this Operation Chesapeake where they operated out of uh, uh, NAS, uh, I'm trying to blank, um, Naval Air Station Norfolk and also um, the Oceana. Virginia Beach, Oceana, sorry. Yeah, they operated out of Oceana and, uh, and Norfolk and then operated on board the uh, uh, on board the Harry S. Truman and that's uh, highlighted here towards the end of the, uh, the article. I don't know if you guys had any key takeaways from Dennis's piece. Go ahead, Brian. Uh, uh, nothing so specific as to be surprised at how much we've written at so many different times or published. And we haven't, I didn't write it. I'm old, but not that old. Um, it's, it feels like a modern idea. Oh, we need allies and partners, you know, um, if it weren't for us, you'd all be speaking German or Japanese or whatever kind of attitude feels like it's forever. And the reality is that even at that moment, we were highly dependent on allies and partners. But um, it's a thread that runs through the whole history of the magazine. And I guess I shouldn't have been surprised by it, but I was. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, it's been highlighted, especially since the 2018 National defense strategy highlights, you know, I think one of the three pillars was allies and partners, right? And so because of that, and, and that carries forth into the current national defense strategy. Um, but as you point out, you know, it's, it's as if we've just discovered this idea of allies and partners, and it's neat to go back in proceedings and go, yeah, not so much. <laughs> this has been, this has been a thread. This has been a, a, something that has not just been happening, but it's also been uh, stimulating the thoughts of people who are writing for proceedings uh, over, you know, a, a very long period of time. By the way, the French authors that you mentioned, uh, the attaché was uh, Jean-Emmanuel Rudelou Je'e, and uh, the art he actually facilitated the article by Captain Charpentier um, about the exercise. But uh, it was, I found that it was more, uh, self-critical than just self-congratulatory the way, you know, sometimes we get post-exercise valedictory addresses. And this right. had plenty of legitimate valedictory to it, but it also had some, and here's what didn't work great, and here's what we learned. That one's worth looking up. Yeah, and the French the French Air Wing, they brought E-2s, 
Uh, so those were the aircraft that operated out of NAS Norfolk, and then their refails operated out of uh, out of Oceana. Uh, Ward somewhere is going to kick me when he says you can't remember Oceana, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> but the refails. Uh, you know, and then they then they spent time on the carrier together with the U.S. Air Wing, and so it was a combined U.S. French Air Wing operation off of a U.S. aircraft carrier um, that you know really just just shows the ability to uh, to integrate. I, I'd love to see, you know, this is me being a little sarcastic. Love to see, you know, Russian naval aircraft try to operate off the Shandong or the Liaoning, the Chinese carrier. I that that partnership is nowhere close to being able to, you know, and and here in the last five years, you've seen a French air wing operate on a U.S. Navy carrier. You've seen U.S. Marine F-35Bs do a deploy workup and deployment on the Queen Elizabeth, the British. And, uh, and then go work from a Japanese carrier on the same deployment. On the same deployment, right? Exactly, exactly. So that is that does highlight this. The, the you know, as some people might say, you know, the superpower that we have is our allies and partners. So, okay, well, we are about out of time for this uh, episode. It's been great to talk to you guys. Uh, terrific uh, on a on a cold rainy day here in the D.C. area. Uh, another issue done. We're now on to the uh, the June issue, which is our. Uh, information warfare uh, themed issue for this year uh, and uh, lots of great content, lots of essay contest winners. We've got midshipmen and cadets essay contest winners. We have the capstone, which is Naval Academy uh, first class midshipmen uh, essay contest. We've got the Naval Postgraduate School essay contest, and I, I'm probably missing two or three others, but we, uh, the, the information warfare essay contest, top three winners, plus one or two additional IWSA contest, which is we're not, uh, which were not winners in the contest, but were terrific articles anyway. So, great stuff coming in the June issue, and um, I wanted to shout out to um, one of our listeners, a guy named Mike Taglich, Taglich Brothers up in uh, New York City. He reached out to me last week and invited me to come speak to his uh, uh, his company's conference, and I was. I said, how do, you, how do you know about me? And he said, I listen to your podcast. And I said, sure, I'll be there. And he wants me to talk about Western Pacific naval buildup, China, Taiwan. And so, um, Mike, thank you for the invitation. I look forward to being with you and your uh, your company on Monday. So, Mike, I'm uh, available to talk to you about style and grammar if you'd like. I'm <laughs> All right. Well, that wraps up another episode of the Proceedings Podcast brought to you by the members of the Naval Institute. To become a member, go to usni.org forward slash join. And until next week, remember, victory begins at the Naval Institute.